The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. We are really, really excited to start this year's season with uh, a lecture by Mark W. Frazier. Uh, Mark is a uh, professor of politics at the New School, and he's the academic director of the China India, or I guess we should say India China Institute. Um, I always want to change the name. But okay, the China <laughs> India India China Institute. Um, uh, he's also the author of a great deal of uh, contemporary research, uh, and just among that, I will point out um, the three monographs: the um, making of the Chinese industrial workplace. Uh, socialist insecurity, which is about the Chinese, uh, the PRC's pension system, um, and hopefully today we're going to hear. I suspect we're going to hear something about his newest book um, called "The Power of Place: Contentious Politics uh, in 20th Century Shanghai and Bombay," which is coming out really, really soon from the Cambridge University Press. Um, we're, we're really lucky to have gotten uh, Professor Fraser to speak to us today, and I hope you give them all, uh, you all, give him a warm welcome. Thanks very much for that introduction, Nick, and thanks to the Con Cornell Contemporary China Initiative and to the Cornell East Asia Program. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, I've given a couple of talks uh, at, at Cornell going back to, I think, uh, 10 years ago, but uh, this, has been, uh, this is certainly the biggest audience uh, I've had, um, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you tonight about uh, my, my book project and some of the more contemporary parts of it. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Um, but the first thing uh, I think I'd like to address is, is you know, why this comparison? Um, I, as, 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 uh, the, as you got in the introduction, I, I've always worked on China. I've worked on China for 20 years um, in doing the research uh, and teaching uh, the two books that were just mentioned. Uh, but um, about eight to 10 years ago, I began getting really interested in uh, India-China comparisons for reasons I can talk about, it, maybe discuss with you afterwards, but I was hired in 2012 to come to the new school and work um, at a place called the India-China Institute, which promotes uh, scholarship and teaching and gives fellowships, postdocs, this kind of thing, undergraduate travel grants to, to students who are interested in, in working on, one, on comparing uh, both places, uh, and so, uh, I've been able to benefit greatly from uh, the resources and the colleagues uh, that I've come into contact with, not just at the New School, but in, uh, in, in Shanghai and uh, in, in Mumbai especially, which is a new place of research for me. Um, and when I began this project, uh, I, I, going back to my work and interest in Shanghai labor politics, textile workers, I kept coming across uh, mentions that uh, the city, as it was called then, Bombay in the 20th century, also had a very lively uh, textile, very large textile workforce and a very lively, uh, in political terms, textile workforce. And so thinking about how that comparison might work, I thought for sure that there would be a lot of research, uh, publications and this sort of thing done that, had, that compared the two cities. And in fact, you come across a lot of casual comparisons, and I'm talking about uh, these consulting reports that come out from time to time on how to build smart cities or what are the lessons of Shanghai that, that Mumbai can learn, this sort of thing. They have kind of a similar uh, skyline as you see there, but more often than not, uh, what one sees, as I say at the bottom of this slide, many people view the two cities as incomparable. And by that I mean whether it's Americans, Chinese, even Indians themselves, uh, the first thing that comes to mind with Mumbai is Mumbai has slums, and uh, Shanghai, along with other Chinese cities, no slums, uh, which is a claim we can get into later. Uh, it's more, much more complicated than that. Uh, Shanghai, even uh, as advanced as it has made, it, with so many advances it has made as a city in terms of urban development, uh, has what you could rightly call slums today. The other point that many Americans, Chinese, Indians uh, uh, make uh, is that Shanghai has this world-class infrastructure, the largest metro system in the world by, by number of kilometers, among many other infrastructural projects, all the bridges, the, the Pudong new area, that's the icon almost for uh, 21st century China. Uh, Mumbai, uh, yes, it has you know, a skyline uh, of sorts that's coming along 
much more gradually, a metro system that's coming along very slowly, uh, but you know, another way that people say incomparable. And then the third, of course, way in which people say incomparable is that you have electoral politics, you have democracy uh, in the city of Mumbai, India's uh, national political institutions, courts, uh, free press, uh, on and on and on, political parties, uh, and of course, you do not have uh, those in the, in the case of Shanghai, in the case of China. Um, so these claims are not crazy, no, they're not completely misinformed, they are true to a certain extent, but um, I would, uh, as, I, as I began looking at the long history of the two cities, uh, I discovered that um, you know, maybe these divergences uh, are relatively recent, and in fact, they had a quite remarkable uh, parallel trajectory over the course of the 20th century. Both cities were really built in the modern sense of the word by the British. Uh, the British uh, in Shanghai, of course, in consort with a multinational uh, governance called the Shanghai Municipal Council that ran uh, the area you see here, the international settlement. Uh, the French had, its, had their own concession, the area here, uh, and the, the old walled city was here, and you had a very fragmented urban sovereignty uh, going on in Shanghai. You had constant debate. This is the classic uh, Li Dong, uh, Long Tang tenement housing that was built uh, in many parts of the international settlement, uh, some of the French concession too. You had uh, informal settlements. You had millions of migrants moving to Shanghai in the 1910s, 20s, 30s to look for work, being driven out of rural areas, working in cotton mills oftentimes, working in the textile sector. Uh, in Bombay, uh, of course, not a multinational you know, government, not an international settlement like you had in Shanghai as a treaty port, but uh, a more old fashioned kind of colony that the British uh, established uh, formally in the 19th century. They had been there before that time. But you also have tenement housing called Charles, uh, uh, which still exist uh, in, in many ways today. Uh, and you have not so much fragmented sovereignty, but you have uh, a British running some parts of the town. You have a lot of informal sovereigns uh, operating uh, in various parts of the city. And I can talk more about that. But what the, the, the subject of the book is this remarkable parallel in contentious politics. And in, for those of you who are doing political science, uh, you may have come across this term before. But it's basically, you could define it as uh, politics by other means. Politics in which people are trying to get what they want, not by using the courts, not by voting, not by doing ordinary kinds of political participation using institutions, but going outside the institutional channels. So strikes, riots, uh, uprisings, rebellions, various things, uh, all of these are covered in the book. Um, and in the more recent years, uh, the, more, the latter part of the 20th century, of course, student protests, these very uh, significant riots that took place in Bombay. And I will uh, cover none of these events during the talk today. If you want to ask me about any of them, I'm happy to, to, uh, to provide information as best I can. But I re will recommend that in uh, this summer, uh, the book will be out with Cambridge University Press. We have the cover so far only. Uh, and I've, I've finished the page proofs. So I'll show you uh, some tables from the book. Uh, but what I really want to talk about is what happens after this, you know, century of, of contentious politics, what does the 21st century look like? And I'm going to read just a couple of short anecdotes uh, that, are, that are actually in the, the opening of the book that describe and try to represent what content, new contentious politics looks like in 21st century Shanghai and Mumbai. Uh, by the way, when I switch back and forth between Bombay and Mumbai, uh, the city was uh, called Bombay, uh, throughout the 20th century. There was a political party that came to power in 1995, and I can tell you more about it uh, later if you're interested. Uh, the political party, when they came to power, decided to change the name of the, of the city to more closely reflect the linguistic, uh, the, the Marathi language 
uh, term for the city, and that's Mumbai. Okay. So uh, here we have a few years ago Nanjing Road. Uh, on the night of June 10th, 2017, a crowd of 1,000 demonstrators protested in the midst of Shanghai's busy central pedestrian shopping street, East Nanjing Road. The marchers represented a distinct subset of Shanghai's property-owning classes. They were Wai Dijen, literally outsiders, who were ineligible to purchase formal housing because they had not met several stringent requirements, well, one of which actually is uh, proof of marriage. They had insisted, they had instead, rather, they instead bought housing in buildings that had originally been designated as commercial use only. Savvy developers who couldn't sell the buildings for commercial purposes sold them instead to these people by installing makeshift gas lines, wiring for household appliances, bathrooms, into spaces that were designated for use as commercial, you know, banks and so forth. But in late May, the Shanghai municipal government, late May of 2017, uh, stopped its practice of looking the other way, of condoning such illegal conversions of commercial uh, buildings, and announced that service providers uh, will shut off the gas, shut off the wastewater services to these buildings. So these people, precarious homeowners, had bought these spaces, had, had spent a lot, had spent their life savings, as they pointed out, uh, to buy uh, a, a unit in these commercial use buildings, and they stood to lose not only their homes, but their life savings, their investments, since these properties were vir virtually unsellable uh, because of the new, newly enforced regulations. Using social media and video uploads, the protesters stated in a comment attached to one of their videos, quote, we understand that there could be transgressions on the part of the developers, but we'd like to also ask the rule makers, the government, to take into consideration our great predicament as the buyers of such houses. Most of us, most of the buyers, are just beguiled ordinary people who have spent generations of family savings just to have a place to live in the great city of Shanghai. And the newly issued rules would absolutely devastate our hopes. The police quickly broke up the rally, arresting one participant, but the Shanghai leaders were very quick to respond. And what did they do? Did they crack down on this? Did they find these people and arrest them? No. They, they responded favorably to the protesters. Two days later, they reversed course, the leaders did, of Shanghai, and gave tacit consent to the continued conversion of these commercial buildings uh, into residential properties. Many observers in Shanghai, I happened to be there at the time, I did not get a chance to witness the protest, unfortunately, but everybody I talked to said that this was the work of party secretary Han Zheng, who at that time was hoping he would get a seat on the top uh, political body, the Politburo Standing Committee. The 19th Party Congress was going to be held in the fall of 2017, and he had made a big mistake in approving the crackdown on commercial use housing, sparking protests, risking his possibility of getting a, a seat on that Politburo Standing Committee. Uh, and so he quickly reversed course, and lo and behold, he did get the seat on the Politburo Standing Committee. Okay, shifting to Mumbai a few years earlier. In late July 2011, an estimated 50,000 mill workers embarked on what they termed the Long March. Maybe they knew something about uh, Com Chinese Communist Party history, I don't know. The Long March was from the textile district in central Mumbai to the Izad Maidan, a big open space uh, where a lot of protests are held in the southern part of the city. The march sm snarled traffic in the city's commercial and administrative centers, but otherwise saw no outbreaks of violence or police actions to arrest the march participants. The march was remarkable in two respects. The media's attention centered on the fact that workers uh, had the support of otherwise heated rivals across multiple political parties. One of them was the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, and its supporters in the Shiv Sena. Uh, and the rivals, the Communist Party of India and its left-wing allies also were supporting. So you kind of had the right and the left both supporting these uh, 
former mill workers. The extraordinary feature of the march was the act itself. By 2011, it was very rare to see large-scale labor protests in the city of Mumbai. The long march, as one commentator put it, was, quote, a throwback to the last century when South Mumbai, with its administrative buildings and corporate offices, would witness frequent demonstrations, close quote. An account from the Times of India remarked that, quote, the scene was straight out of the 1960s when Mumbai was, this, was seen as the center of the labor movement, close quote. Now, this march had been organized by a group of labor unions uh, led by a socialist union, uh, called it under the acronym GKSS, which stood at the forefront of a campaign to provide housing. Here's the connection with the first story. Provide housing for the city's laid off textile workers uh, who numbered 145,000. Promises of free housing for all the city's poor and low income residents, including slum residents and ex mill workers, stretched back to 1995 when a Shiv Sena-backed coalition came to power in the state government. That was the same party that changed the name. They also promised free housing for everyone in the city. This is electoral politics. Uh, free housing for slum residents and mill workers in, to be specific. So housing for mill workers and land to build on had been a source of contention over municipal development plans and court cases that followed as uh, as mill companies sought to convert the land for high-end commercial and retail functions. Again, this is trying to convert mill land, uh, industrial use land, into residential, commercial land. Uh, at these protests, at the rally where the march ended, uh, the wife of a mill worker declared, Charles, that's those worker tenements uh, I showed a couple of slides ago, Charles in central Mumbai have been replaced by malls. There it the state government should provide a roof, provide us with a roof over our heads, close quote. And the chief minister of the state, this is like the, the prime minister of, of the large state of Maharashtra, responded by setting up a committee to identify scarce land resources on which worker housing could be built. And by 2017, 15,000 out of the 145,000 workers and their families had received for free uh, a 225 square foot housing unit many of them situated on the former land occupied by mill compounds. The other 130,000 uh, workers and families waited their turn, and the GKSS held occasional demonstrations like this to, make the, to speed up the pace uh, of building without uh, further delays. So these two protests are representative, as I said, of a new pattern of contentious politics in the 21st century, about who gets to live and who gets to work in the city and under what conditions. And uh, it's, it's really, as I'll say in more detail in a few slides, it's about the question of almost citizenship, of who, who is the, who gets, not, not about who's Indian and who's Chinese, everyone's a national citizen, but who belongs, who has the, the right to inhabit and work in the city. And these are really uh, important debates going on in both cities now. Shanghai protests in the 21st century, um, the, the most uh, prominent have been a couple of nationalist protests uh, that made lots of headlines. Uh, one, 1999, some an anti-American protest, 2005, anti-Japanese. These, of course, are related to foreign policy much more uh, and nothing having to do really with, with uh, local politics. Lots of stories about nail households, uh, families that refused to uh, accept the unfair price uh, and unfair compensation offered to them by developers and stayed in place as the land around them, the buildings around them were, were uh, uh, dug up, excavated, uh, and you, hence the, 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 the figure the term nail household. It looks like a nail sticking up out of a, a board. Uh, not in my backyard kinds of protests. The one seen here in the picture is in 2008 when many, many, uh, I mean several tens of thousands of Shanghai residents uh, protested against the plans to build the high-speed maglev train right through their neighborhoods uh, on the west side of the river. As you, many of you may know, there is a maglev train uh, in, in Pudong going out to the airport. And these days, more increasingly, lots of home sale 
swindles going on as people are persuaded to buy at a certain price when their building is finished. Uh, they're thinking the price will be higher. It turns out nowadays that after their unit has been completed and the building's ready to be moved into, the market price is way below what they agreed to pay, what they did pay a year before. And there are uh, you know, many kinds of, of fights over that for being uh, ripped off. In Mumbai, uh, lots of hawkers protests, vend you know, street vendors who, who want to work in the city and want to uh, have a, uh, want to sell their wares uh, on the streets and sidewalks. Mill workers demanding housing, as the case I just read you about. Uh, many NGOs, of course, are very active in India, and especially in Mumbai. Many of them advocate for slum residents and for uh, low income for the poor. Just as many NGOs are, are more middle class driven and are quite interested in um, uh, creating what they call the slum free Mumbai. So in other words, and the courts uh, are, are supportive, generally speaking, of, of claims to uh, kick out people who have moved in after, uh, who have only moved to the city very recently. Uh, and as one of the people I interviewed uh, in thinking about protests in Mumbai over the, over the century, uh, and especially over the last few decades, said the, the era of the big march, the big morta, is, is over. Um, that even this, this is also from the 2011 long march. This was uh, you know, a rare event, and, and really we don't expect to see uh, future such mobilizations. So what's happened here is that the politics of the workplace uh, is being um, supplanted by the politics of the neighborhood and the city, fights over and strikes over wages, benefits, condition, uh, being supplanted by uh, disputes over residence, disputes over being relocated. I'm not saying that um, there are no more disputes over wages and benefits. Of course, we know in Chinese cities there are many cases where unpaid migrant workers uh, have to uh, publicly you know, protest against the fact that they haven't been paid. Uh, but, but generally speaking, we see much more uh, you know, residents and neighborhood politics rather than wages, benefits, conditions. Labor capital contention uh, being, um, you know, not, not, again, not completely uh, eliminated, but citizenship contention, who belongs in the city, uh, becoming just as hotly uh, debated as old-fashioned labor capital contention. And housing becomes a marker of citizenship, where you live, what kind of place you live in, uh, almost uh, defines your legal claims and status in the city. Housing, of course, has been a key area of social policy, which I, I worked on uh, in my earlier project. And um, I think you ha I, I highlight two comments here by prominent specialists on, uh, on, in urban India and urban China. One, Arjuna Padurai, who said, uh, it, a while back, that housing is the single most critical site of this city's, of Mumbai's politics of citizenship. And Zhang Li, who uh, has written lots about migrant workers and urban citizenship, uh, said in 2002 that expanding home ownership will produce new forms of social inclusion and exclusion and will thus become a new site for contesting urban citizenship. So these claims are. Uh, they, they've been out there for a while, but what I'm doing in this project is really showing empirically how it works in practice. And uh, a brief couple of slides, you know, for general background, uh, urban China, urban India, you know, I'm sure, uh, about the urban HUCO, the urban household registration versus the uh, non-urban registration, that being a big divider in terms of what access migrant workers can or cannot <laughs> get in terms of access to uh, the city. Um, Chinese cities, in international comparative perspective, decent public services, water, electricity, uh, sewage, waste removal, schools, um, you know, especially compared to India, uh, a, a better overall uh, uh, distribution and, and delivery, uh, and social policies, uh, unemployment, pension, medical care, health care, expanded really rapidly uh, in the la insurance anyway. Uh, there are many problems with remaining with uh, the actual 
costs of healthcare and this sort of thing, and, and access to various clinics. In urban India, uh, you have, as I referred, to, alluded to earlier, cutoff dates, so that if you arrive in Mumbai after the year 2000, it's almost like you are a, a, a migrant worker in a Chinese city without an urban household registration. You're just eliminated from many kinds of, of benefits. You can vote, okay, you can vote. You can go to court, but uh, in terms of the housing stuff I'll talk about, I'll show you, you're, you're, you have no, no chance. Uh, poor public services, again, relative to China especially, uh, and uh, electoral politics, voting, <laughs> Uh, very important in urban India, uh, as well as in recent years, like China, an expansion in, in social legislation. Comparing the two cities, uh, Shanghai has about twice the population, but it has a much larger, if you look at the top line, um, you know, it is a, a provincial level entity, uh, and even the, the mayor and the party secretary of Shanghai has the equal rank of a provincial uh, governor or party secretary in China. Uh, Mumbai, much smaller uh, area, uh, very dense uh, as a result, very high densities in population. Um, the uh, formal housing, those with, you know, just not even 60% have live in places that are actually registered and regulated and so forth. And 42% of the population lives on 8% of the land in these highly dense uh, slum settlements. Um, and as best some people can, can gather, that as of about, as of 2011, this number may be a little higher, that uh, 2 million, maybe it's 2.2 now, have come after the, 2000, the year 2000 cutoff date. In, in Shanghai, we have about this 60-40 uh, distribution in terms of having urban hukou, not having urban hukou. This is from 2015. Um, people living in the urban periphery of Shanghai, uh, generally speaking, recent migrants to the city, something like uh, five million uh, out, of, uh, out of either of these, mostly out of this one. Um, in recent years, the number has reached 27, 28 million, and there's a big campaign on now uh, to reduce Shanghai's population by evicting people, by evicting uh, migrants, so that by 2020, next year, we're gonna have 25 million uh, uh, people in the city. Um, I can come back to this if there's interest, but this just shows you some other Indian cities. Uh, extremely small land area for Mumbai, the hot, very high uh, density in, in population, uh, really poor water connection, really poor sewage treatment as a percentage of water supply, and very low uh, uh, road density uh, in terms of you know, road infrastructure. Uh, for this project, again, it, it's an extension of the book, but in more, re in more recent visits, I've been doing site visits along with local uh, scholars fr from research institutes and universities, interviewing a few experts, uh, collecting policy documents, nothing, uh, you know, nothing unusual or ordinary or unique in terms of, of methods here, uh, though I hope to in the future, uh, depending on conditions in China, do a, a more systematic um, work by particularly interviewing uh, migrants who have moved, who have relocated from urban villages. And I'll, I'll show you more uh, about what the urban villages demolition looks like and relocation uh, in a moment. All right, so how does this all get started? I would say we could call it the financialization of land or commodification without privatization. Various regulations passed, interestingly, almost at the same year in each city that transform uh, the way urban land is dealt with. Of course, in, in China, in Shanghai, all land is, is urban land. Uh, in all land is urban land. All urban land is owned by the state. Uh, but these regulations allow district governments to lease land over long-term periods to commercial developers. And the deal is that uh, the district government uh, will remove the residents <laughs> and the commercial developers will come in and build malls, high-end retail, hotels, et cetera, 
uh, you know the story if you've been to Shanghai or any large Chinese city. Uh, and in, in Mumbai, we have a similar kind of process going on for a, a period there in the mid-1990s. Uh, property values in Mumbai were the highest in the world. I haven't checked recently, but uh, they're, they're both uh, really quite high. Um, the question is, who gets to use the repurposed land? Where are the residents relocated? And who gets compensated? And how? And who does not? As I just mentioned, you got state-owned land in Chinese cities urban land being owned by the state, leased long-term to real estate developers. So you have the demolition and uh, relocation of inner city residents on a mass scale. I'll show you a table in a second that, that depicts that. Uh, in Mumbai, now on the right, in Perel district, uh, the photograph is from, uh, this is, it's hard to see, but there are chawls here in the foreground and a tower coming up behind them. This is on uh, textile mill lands. This is from the, the, the book, and that's a page proof. It's that large F in the background. But um, this table, uh, if you look uh, at the middle line, you see that the peak was between the 1990s and mid uh, first decade of the 21st century, about 825,000 families. If you multiply that by a four, uh, even maybe five, you know, you're talking three to four million people being pushed out to suburban extensions and by the latter part of this period uh, to around the Outer Ring Road. These days, uh, you're still getting uh, per pretty high numbers of people being relocated. Uh, and now it's beyond the Outer Ring Road in the suburbs. In Mumbai, uh, the statistics are really shaky and difficult to come across. Um, but as best this estimate can tell from this source, uh, about 450,000 families. Remember, Mumbai is half the population of Shanghai, so we're getting into uh, almost comparable territory when we're, we're talking about half the number of households. Uh, other people say that it happens really in drips and drabs, and you get over a 10-year period, maybe up to a million households being relocated. So uh, this is another point where you know the conventional wisdom says, oh, Shanghai, authoritarian government, Chinese Communist Party, easy to move people out, therefore Shanghai develops the way it does. And in Mumbai, oh, we have voting, we have NGOs, we have courts, we have democracy, can't move people as easily, when in fact the statistics show some people are being moved uh, uh, in this period. And so, you know, it's more difficult to just attribute it to democracy versus, uh, versus authoritarian <coughs> government. Uh, who gets relocated and where? This is a... Uh, uh, Yangpu is the old textile district in Shanghai. The, there are many blocks, many neighborhoods that still have this really old, um, you know, 1930s, 1940s housing. Textile workers still living in there, uh, waiting to be relocated. Uh, the people who live in this uh, Sanlin town, uh, Sanlin town in Pudong, in 2000, uh, this is taken from 2017. Uh, they, were, they were moved not in 2017, they were moved in, say, five years earlier in 2012. And uh, as I talked with several of these relocated families, you know, they would say something like, uh, I have an 80 square meter apartment now. Back there, it was about 10 square meters for five or six of us with, a sh with no, uh, with, you know, shared, shared toilets and, and shaky electricity and so on. We now have an 80 square meter apartment. We got, we got here, we had an 80 square meter apartment. The land price, the, the property price then was about 8,500 renminbi per square meter. So it was about, you know, 600, 700,000 renminbi, 100,000 US more or less in 2012. And now in the five years I've been sitting here, look at the price, the, the price has gone through the roof. And now I have a three and a half million uh, renminbi property. You know, I have uh, four or 500,000 uh, US dollars property. I mean, they didn't put it in those terms. They were thinking in renminbi. But, um, you know, it's an interesting process. So it's not surprising when I go with these local researchers to talk to people in these neighborhoods. They're not saying, as I think sometimes the conventional wisdom would be, is that we, we, we want to stay here. We're going to be a nail household. They desperately want to. I wouldn't say desperately, but they, they are, uh, let's say, amenable to being relocated 
to Sanlin when they can have that as the compensation, right? Uh, so, and this is very different. Say 15, 20 years ago, you know, the, the, they would come through a neighborhood like this, relocate people with, you know, buildings that were unfinished, buildings that didn't have water yet, buildings that didn't have electricity or gas yet. And there was, that's where you saw a lot of the protests and disturbances uh, over the unfair uh, process of relocation. But now, you know, there is this, for now anyway, while property prices remain super elevated, uh, there is this. Okay, turning to urban villages where migrants to Shanghai live, okay? Here is the uh, Jiayin Sun urban village, not so far from Fudan University, some of you may know, or Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. I've given talks at both places. They go, where, where, where is that? I've never heard of it. I say, it's across the street. You should go over there sometime. And look, migrant workers here, um, there are, this is one of 36 urban villages in Shanghai on collective land. It's still agricultural land owned by the members of the rural collective, surrounded now, of course, by urban land. But in, in some respects, it's its own self-governed area where the members of the collective uh, make certain decisions. They don't have complete sovereignty, of course, but uh, they make uh, decisions on the, the grassroots governance and the management of the, of the, uh, of the space. Uh, you can see they're not so, so keen on uh, electric code safety. Uh, and this, of course, means that the, this, this is going to be demolished soon, that this character uh, tie. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying, the, the government is trying to reduce the population. Uh, by getting rid of these urban villages. Uh, the, the phrase you hear all the time is, you know, chaotic, uh, dirty, uh, cheap, or tough, you know, uh, uh, short, uh, shortcomings. And, and Huang, uh, you know, pornographic, there's, there's illicit stuff going on inside uh, of these urban villages. Um, so the members of the collective get compensated very handsomely for when the urban government comes in and makes the deal. Uh, and it's brought under uh, urban township or district management, but the, the, the tenants, the migrants, get nothing. Uh, migrants in Shanghai, even as this chart shows, uh, live a very precarious existence in terms of having only a verbal contract, uh, very few written contracts for their rental. Uh, the facilities are, you know, if you've ever spent time in Shanghai in the, in the winter, you know that heating is pretty much of an absolute must and hardly any to speak of in the urban villages in Shanghai compared to you know, Beijing where it's, it's essential. Uh, Guangzhou may be less, less important. Um, air conditioning, internet. This is from Fu Long Wu's uh, study uh, of urban villages. Um, here is a, a a place in Minhang, an urban village in Minhang district, and I know with the light in the room, you may not be able to see. This is the electric tower. Okay, that's the same one, six months later. Uh, so this urban village uh, of Liu Jiaqiang has been wiped out. The, one of the farmers who I talked to there had been receiving 400,000 RMB in rent from the tenants, you know, he's the landlord, so to speak. Um, he was compensated. 80,000 RMB per square meter, uh, and, and it becomes a U.S. millionaire as a result of the being dispossessed. The migrants, of course, are out of luck. They're gone. This is the biggest urban village in Shanghai uh, that was demolished in 2016. Han Zheng, the guy I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, came by in, in the early part of 2016. And uh, that was the signal for <laughs> the company that was doing this uh, demolition to really kick it into gear, get moving, move out 31,000 migrants, uh, find places for these wholesale markets and stalls to be relocated way out in the far periphery. Um, the, just like the previous slide, the, the collective, members of the collective, the village households, they get that 80 square meter. That's the standard uh, 80 square meter um, square feet, 800, 900 square foot unit. Again, this is taken from a tower uh, that they took me up to and we were looking down on the demolished village, uh, urban village, but this was one of the units that the people uh, would be living in. 
Okay, I'll go through Mumbai uh, quickly um, as we are looking at yeah, 516. Um, Parel District, this is the old uh, textile district, you like Yangpu District in Shanghai. And you see, this is a large textile mill compound. You see some trees, you see some buildings that, that, that will be significant uh, in a second. But basically, the way that the textile sector left Mumbai is interesting. Um, by the 1980s, the value of the land is much greater than the, the, what you can make producing textiles. And there was a strike uh, in which the 250,000 then workers went out, but the mill owners, knowing that the land was, it was a great excuse for them to not negotiate with the, the workers and to essentially let the strike go on forever so that the mills would, would be, you know, have an excuse to be, to be shut down. Uh, just close, go bankrupt, close for business. Uh, but the question of who owns the mill land is interesting. Uh, it, it, you know, the fact that the British leased the, this land to private companies a hundred years ago for pennies, uh, you know, gets a debate going about when that land is commodified, like I said earlier, who gets the money? The mill companies? Why should they get it? Just because they had, had the, the um, you know, they don't own the land, the, the, the government owns the land, for and it's used, supposed to be used for industrial purposes. So there were these regulations I mentioned earlier, the 2001 regulations, and I won't get into a lot of the details here, but basically it's worked out where uh, there, used, there, there was originally going to be a lot more floor space, but 100,000 square meters available for uh, workers to receive 25 square meter units that they can sell after sitting on, after owning for five years. So you get right on the grounds of these old mill compounds, these huge, uh, this is a, a 25, 24 story building with 25 square meter housing uh, units within it. And, uh, you know, not to the same magnitude, uh, but, you know, a family that moved in in 2011, 500,000 rupees, that has risen tenfold now. So they have a, a, a 5 million rupee uh, property that they can now, if they wish, sell to, to someone and uh, take the cash and, and you know, leave the city because there's no place uh, that they could, they could get to elsewhere in the city for uh, even for 5 million rupees. So th this is the, the, um, a map of basically half, the southern half of Mumbai. This is the Parel Textile District I showed you a few slides ago. This is, uh, these yellow uh, areas are uh, so-called, as it says, slum clusters. And this one, uh, Basi Nagar, uh, I'll show you in a minute. Um, same kind of process, uh, with, similar process, I'll say, with the textile mill. Uh, there, a, a, a policy put in place in 1995 to rehabilitate, to build on site. Um, in practice, meaning that the, the slum residents are moved to the northeast of the city. 70% of their approval is required of a community. Uh, you have to get 70% of the households to approve of this deal. Um, this is this government, as I said, in 95 that had promised 800,000 units for everyone. They're, they're only 150,000, uh, but even that surprises a lot of the observers. And the interesting uh, thing at work here, they, they kind of copied uh, New York City and some American cities where you use something called a transferable, transferable development right. And you, you can basically, uh, if the builder comes in and says, I will build this <coughs> housing on the side of the slum, give it to the slum residents for free, and then you give me a certificate to allow me basically an exemption so I can go to another part of the city and build on, on, on land and build way far above the, the, what the, the, the building height rule would be. And so what this has led to is dumping the poor, the slum residents in one part of the city and building vast numbers of skyscrapers in the other part of the city. So imagine, you know, the developer here, look how close they put the buildings together. These are, this is for the slum residents. Uh, 21 square meter units, 4,500 of them. 
Um, this place has all sorts of problems with the engineering and the structure and the foundations, and there's a lot of concern about the safety of the buildings. Uh, the residents, you know, again, when asked, uh, I talked to the head of the housing federation of this place, and he says, yeah, when we moved in in 2007, the each unit was about 2,500 US. Now they're 20,000 uh, US. This is a great deal for my community, he was boasting. Um, well, uh, yes and no. Um, there are all sorts of, of problems. As a, you know, one of them is the safety issue. The other is uh, the ways in which um, people are you know, duped into selling uh, at prices that might be below what's the market price. And you know, when you, you give the developer, the developer in that trading transferable development rights scheme has every incentive to make these as cheaply as possible so that the, the money can be put towards making uh, the investment in the, the high-end real estate that will make them much bigger profits. So huge debate uh, over these uh, uh, slum rehabilitation scheme in Mumbai. Um, it, this one a negative view. This one a, a positive view saying that um, you know, some settlers, there's the word citizenship, they have attained through civic mobilization strategies and some political institutions in order to get what they consider adequate housing. This really needs to be tested more systematically to kind of see uh, if, if this claim is true. And the way to do that is you just have to find more uh, survey or interview research uh, that you can do with uh, different communities that have been relocated. Uh, in 2004 and five, that year that there were really high numbers in that table uh, a few slides ago, uh, Critics call this Operation Shanghai because the Mumbai government was looking at Shanghai and, and, and uh, trying, there was even a McKinsey consulting report about, about uh, doing infrastructure, doing land clearance, kicking out uh, residents of the sort they had seen happening in Shanghai. And this, this uh, fellow here, uh, a, a municipal uh, official, sounds very much like, uh, well, certain American politicians these days. <laughs> they want to put the fear of the consequences of migration into these people. We have to restrain them from coming to Mumbai. And again, he's not talking about foreigners coming to Mumbai. He's talking about uh, rural people or people from elsewhere in India coming to Mumbai. And the way he's going to put the fear of, uh, of the consequences of migration into them is by destroying um, it, the, the, the huts, the, settle, the, the, the shelters of about a half a million people who arrived at that time, there was a January 1995 cutoff date. So, you know, anyone who had moved to the city in the last 10 years was vulnerable to uh, eviction. So, overall lessons, summary, summarizing, those who receive compensation for being loca relocated, those who kind of have a citizenship uh, uh, status in, in, of sorts, former textile mill workers in both cities, slum residents, some of them, uh, even though the housing is, is, as we saw, not so great for those who lived, moved to Mumbai before the year 2000, inner city evictees, uh, and the later the better, uh, the later the better the housing, uh, the rural collective, the very few uh, uh, people in the rural collectives who, the privileged few who get, you know, become millionaires when they sell their collective land or they transfer it into urban administration. Those who receive no compensation and therefore are sub, substandard or subclasses of citizens uh, are going to be the tenants, those who rent from slum. You know, slums are a very interesting, complex systems and they're people who build their shelters and then they lease out upstairs or side uh, dwellings to residents. Uh, tenants in urban villages we saw, and in, in many respects, anyone who's moved to either city in the last 20 years uh, are under, underprivileged and discriminated against in, in the ways, uh, in housing terms, as I've suggested. Conclusion, deindustrialization, financialization or commodification of land, new infrastructures, these changing political geographies influence, in many ways, the claims, the identities, and the claims of the protesters. Citizenship depends on when you got and what you got in terms of, of policies, 
or when you arrived and how you arrived and what you did in the city before the 1990s. So for most families who were there in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you have some citizenship status, some claim for uh, this, this housing scheme. This has uh, been talked about, the, the urbanist Ananya Roy talks about the politics of compensation, where citizenship is produced through, what are you going to give me? Uh, for loss of jobs, loss of residence, one had prior to the reforms, uh, the insiders make claims to policies, post-reform migrants uh, are non-citizen, not compensated at all for loss of job or residence. Now, you know, for people who look at cities at the, the macro global scale, you know, some of the, including many of my colleagues at the New School, you're gonna go, this is global capitalism, this is neoliberal developmentalism, this is just, you know, two, two, two stories of the same thing going on, same theme globally. And, you know, of course, they're right up to a point. Accumulation by dispossession is another common phrase. David Harvey talks about, uh, capitalism in the 21st century operating this way. Um, and he even has an essay where he talks about Mumbai and Shanghai uh, operating this way. But um, I would say that it's not all dispossession. It's accumulation for sure, but it's accumulation through forms of compensation. Um, it's not classic capitalism where you're just take, you're kicking people off the land and making them landless overnight and then they are the, the vast unemployed ranks of the proletariat. Um, that Shanghai and Mumbai as post-industrial cities, uh, urban citizenship is extremely difficult to, to gain, but uh, we have a process, a complex process, politics of compensation rather than outright you know, uh, dispossession by the state of those living in the city. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions.